and I am going to juggle two contradictory goals uh, in it. One is to entertain those who may already have heard, say, yesterday's talk and will be there, and also to, to make it self-contained for those who were not. And so the way it is going to be is that I'm going to give sort of a brief overview of the entire thing that will not be a miss, I think, even for those who did attend yesterday. And then, and then I will pick some topics that I did not cover in detail here. And so that's, 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 that's the idea. OK, so <coughs> overview never hurts. So let me start with an overview now also. <laughs> uh, OK, so, <coughs> so first of all, uh, we are solving the string isomorphism problem. OK, for which the input is a permutation group on some domain which I always denote by omega. I, I am going to refer to this as the ambient group. OK, and this omega is the set of positions. So strings, strings are, are, uh, are just uh, functions from omega to some finite alphabet. And, and we are playing anagrams within the ambient group. Okay? So two strings are equivalent if there is an element of the group that transforms uh, one into the other. So the, uh, the set of G isomorphisms of two strings is the set of those elements of G that transform this string into that string. Okay? So that's the definition. And that's the target object. This object uh, okay, so, so the automorphisms uh, are just the isomorphisms to itself. And then one can say that this is always either empty or a coset of uh, uh, the automorphism group for any sigma in the set of isomorphisms. Okay, so this is obvious, and but this, this allows us a concise representation of, of this set. So when we, <coughs> when when I say that uh, that we are given a group, then it's always given by a list of generators. We are given a coset, then it's always given by a list of generators of a group plus one coset representative. Okay, so the yes. Yeah, so, uh, yes, okay, so, okay, so, uh, yes, I, I, I should mention there is a, there is a, a, a 40-year-old polynomial time theory of permutation groups, which is always implicit here, which, uh, in particular, if, if a group G is given by a list of generators, I don't know, sigma 1, sigma k, then the membership problem, okay, uh, we, we are given, so this is, this is a subgroup of the symmetric group on omega, and we are given, uh, given tau in, which is also a permutation. Uh, the question is, uh, is tau a member of G? Okay, so this question is, can be answered in polynomial time, or uh, the other question is, what is of G that can be answered in polynomial time, or if I have a uh, if I have a uh, a subset uh, of, of of these elements, a subset of uh, okay. Polynomial yeah, in omega, yeah, polynomial. Uh, well, uh, polynomial in the input length, okay. So if, uh, if 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 somebody gives a lot of redundant generators, then I I still have to read those generators, okay. So uh, there is no avoiding that. However. This also tells us that I can always limit myself to a non-redundant set of generators because, I, because with membership testing I can eliminate any generator that is not needed and a non-redundant set of generators never has more than two n elements where n is the, number, n is the size of omega, okay? So, let me, yeah, I can say that if, if S is a subset of G and it is a non-redundant set of generators then this set is not greater than 2n, okay? 
So that's uh, okay. So that result actually uh, that's that's also my result from from I don't know a few decades ago. But uh, <laughs> no, n log n is trivial. N log n log n is trivial. Uh, yeah, triv trivial is log of the order of g, which is less than log of m factorial, which which is less than log of this is less than n log n. Okay, that's a trivial upper bound on any non-redundant set of generators. Okay, uh, but this uh, this uses the classification. So. Yes, yes, that's 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 exactly. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's that's perfectly correct. Okay, and then there is one more thing that that is also implicitly used many times, and this is the normal closure. Okay, so if I have some elements tau one tau sub l in G. Then I may I am interested in the normal closure of uh, of of uh, the set tau one tau l uh, <coughs> in G. Okay, so this is the smallest normal subgroup that uh, that contains all these elements, and that's also polynomial time computable. Okay, so. So basically, the the, the uh, fundamental uh, okay, and and from this uh, the uh, uh, kernel of action, okay, okay. So so if we have a permutation group G, and then we have a, uh, we we map it into another uh, uh, permutation group, okay, then this is this is an action. So this group G is defined as a group acting on a set omega, but it acts on another set also. Then we are very, very much interested in the kernel of that action, and that again can be computed in polynomial time. Okay, that's a combination of membership and normal closure. Okay. Okay, so polynomial time always refers to the length of the input. Okay, so length of the input is a combination of the number n, which is the size of omega, then how many generators I am given here, how, and here, here it would be also the size of gamma, um, and, uh, and, and that's it. Yeah, that's it. Well, okay. I'm sorry? That's also polynomial time. Yes. Okay. So. No. 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 That's not. No. 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 I mean, you have to. You have to show. Okay. So, how is a how is a homomorphism given? A homomorphism given by the images of the generators, but not every map of the gener set of generators uh, extends to a homomorphism. No, this is what you do. Okay, so how do we check homomorphism? So we look at, at the generators, sigma i and phi of sigma i, and these pairs, these pairs generate, okay, for i equal 1 to k, these pairs generate a subgroup of g cross, uh, say, a, say, h, if, if, if the homomorphism is from g to h, okay? All right? And now what we check is that this subgroup has to be isomorphic to G. In fact, uh, all the only thing that we need, let me call this group uh, M, and what we need to check, so phi is a homomorphism, if and only if the order of M is the same as the order of G. And that's what we check. Okay? And that we can, because this is still, this is a, still a permutation group. It's a permutation group on the union of omega and gamma. Okay. All right. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so there are there are these basic questions that are uh, implicit everywhere, and and, and uh, they are all polynomial time time solvable. Uh, <coughs> and that's that's still back from 1980. Uh, I mean, it was analyzed in 1980, but the algorithm already existed with Sims in the mid 1960s where he was already using them. In fact, uh, the, this uh, uh, computational machinery was really working, and it was part of the classification of finite simple, part of the construction of, 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 of sporadic simple groups. So it was, it was an important tool on the way to the classification. <coughs> yes? 
Yeah. They are equivalent. So the, the isomorphism problem and automorphism problem are always equivalent. But, the, the, but uh, when we do recursion, even if we only try to solve automorphism problem, the recursion always takes us to isomorphism. So we have to solve. So the natural thing is to, to recurse on isomorphisms rather than, than, than on, on automorphisms. OK? Yeah. So uh, nevertheless, often enough, uh, uh, one just talks about how to find the automorphism group with the implicit uh, implication that whatever I can do with automorphisms, I can also do with isomorphisms. And this is mostly true. So if I, if I have some ideas like, like, like partitioning, then that, that gives me an idea how to do the automorphisms. But actually, I do the same partitioning on the other, and then, then that gives me similar uh, restrictions on isomorphisms. So this works most of the time. But I have a very notable counterexample to this. So there is a very part of this algorithm where, uh, where, where exactly this uh, um, <coughs> uh, unaffected stabilizer lemma is being used, where all of a sudden we learn a lot about automorphisms, and there is no way to transfer th that to the const context of isomorphisms. So that's where this aggregation step comes into play, where we try to extend the information in such a way that it will be usable to, to, to refute uh, isomorphism. But uh, that's, that's, so that's a rare example. In fact, that's the only example in the literature that I know of where, where one can do something with automorphisms that cannot be reproduced for, for isomorphism. I, I am going to show that because one of the things I want to talk about now is, is, is the aggregation. Okay? So, so the, 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 the procedure that I, I, I was trying to, to outline yesterday uh, the, 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 at, at the heart of it is uh, <coughs> uh, this, this uh, local certificates algorithm. So uh, what you can, uh, uh, the way you can think of this is we are trying to understand a large structure that is supposed to have uh, uh, essentially full symmetric group of symmetries. And, and what we do is instead we look at small parts of it and we try to understand, OK, does that small part work uh, like uh, full with full symmetry? And, and, and then there are two possible outcomes. Either it does or it doesn't. And we want certificates for both possible outcomes. And, and if the certificates um, the certificate is positive, then, uh, then, then we, we want, uh, we want it if, if, if the answer is positive, so the, the, the automorphisms act uh, as the full symmetric group locally, then we want to prove that by way of, uh, we want to certify that by way of automorphisms that take the entire input string into account. And, and there we do a step where we, where we get automorphisms, but, but, but we cannot uh, uh, correlate the what happens with the two inputs. OK? All right. So <coughs> OK, so the first thing that, uh, so, so let me yeah, begin reviewing what's happening. The first thing is Lux's group theoretic divide and conquer. So this uses the natural partitioning that is built into the structure of permutation groups. So first of all, we have uh, orbits, and then we have, uh, we have uh, blocks of imprimitivity. So if, uh, if I have a permutation domain, uh, then, then, uh, then, then, then uh, I can split it into, into orbits of that permutation group, and then the orbits can further be partitioned into blocks of imprimitivity. So this gives a natural uh, combinatorial structure to the underlying set that only the permutation group. And basically, we are only stuck if, if the group is primitive, in which case this kind of uh, division is not available. Mm. Primitive group does not have blocks of imprimitivity. Yeah. Yeah, right. The orbits. And maybe there is just one orbit, then the group is transitive. And then this thing is inside, inside one orbit, I can look at blocks of imprimitivity. So that means this is an invariant partition. So the blocks themselves are not invariant under the group action, but the partition itself is invariant. So, so every one of these sets can only be transported one into one of the other sets. It cannot be transported into something that cuts across several uh, of these blocks. Okay? 
So that's, uh, that's what I mean. So the equivalence relation, that is the part, a uh, partition is the same thing as an equivalence relation, that relation is invariant under the group action. Okay, so if there is such a non-trivial partition that is invariant under that, uh, that, that invariant under the group action, uh, then that group is imprimitive. If there is no such uh, partition, then the group is called uh, primitive. And so primitive groups are basically the uh, so if if you uh, you can break up permutation groups in a way that you can think of of primitive permutation group being the building blocks of. Of, of all permutation groups. So if you understand a lot about primitive permutation groups, you will be able to understand a lot about permutation groups altogether. And, and from the algorithmic point of view, uh, primitive permutation groups are the case where we, we are somewhat clueless in, in this algorithm. So that's where we, we don't know what happens. And the primitive permutation groups will arise in the following way. So first of all, okay, Yes, primitive is by definition transitive, and uh, and it does not have blocks. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yes, yes, that's that's uh, that's that's a very important observation. That that if I have a transitive permutation group, it can have many uh, different uh, systems of imprimitivity. One example that I gave yesterday was the system of uh, the, the 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 group of symm geometric symmetries of the hexagon. But if we look at the star of David, that's a partition. Uh, that's that's an imprimitivity partition, and and uh, then then uh, just the diagonally opposite pairs. That's another. Okay, so these are two distinct uh, systems of imprimitivity. Or 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 an, uh, an example I could give is is if you look at a uh, if if I, if I look at the regular permutation representation of G, so G can be uh, G is isomorphic to 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 uh, it can be isomorphically embedded in the symmetric group on G by associating say the right translations. So with the element of G, I associate this uh, map. Every element goes to G times itself. Okay. So this is the regular permutation representation of the group. So this is, this is how Cayley proved that every abstract group is isomorphic to a permutation group. And for this representation, every subgroup defines a system of imprimitivity. So you take a subgroup and its cosets, then that's a system of imprimitivity. Okay, so it, it's a, a very rich set of, of, uh, of, of, of blocks of imprimitivity. Even the minimal sets of blocks are, are rich. However, not too rich, and this is going to be important, so let me say it now. Uh, <coughs> so, uh, so it's an observation that if G is transitive, okay, it's a transitive group of the symmetric group on omega, uh, then the number of maximal systems of imprimitivity <laughs> and maximal system means that the blocks are minimal. Okay? Is at most n minus one. Okay? So this is going to play a role in, in the analysis of the algorithm. Uh, what we uh, I, I'm sorry? Oh yes, one can find them in polynomial time. Yes, that's correct. Yes, in fact, they are they are really easy to find, and and uh, and again, this is something that computational group series have already done way before it occurred to anybody to analyze them. That okay, that's polynomial time. It was just efficient, and 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 indeed it is. Um, uh, I'll say a word about it uh, also how how to find them, and because because uh, because it's 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 instructive and it is going to also link up with. This uh, the base fair Lehman. Yes. In omega, n is always the number of elements in omega. So n is the s n is my s the size of my permutation domain. Okay. So uh, <coughs> okay. So why is it so, uh, this so? Because if okay. So we are talking about non-trivial blocks of imprimitivity. What are the trivial blocks of imprimitivity? What are the trivial blocks of imprimitivity? The singletons and 
and the whole set together, right, okay? All right, so now if I include the trivial blocks of imprimitivity, then it is quite obvious that the intersection of two blocks of imprimitivity is again a block of imprimitivity, okay? A block of imprimitivity is characterized in the following way. So say delta subset omega is a block of imprimitivity if and only if for every sigma in G, uh, the image of this uh, set is either itself or disjoint or, or uh, disjoint from itself. Okay? So that characterizes a block of imprimitivity. If I found a block of imprimitivity, then the corresponding system of imprimitivity consists of all translates of that block of imprimitivity, and that's going to give a partition. Okay, uh, why, is a, why is it a partition? It covers everything because the group is transitive and they are pairwise disjoint because of this. Okay, all right. So in particular, if I have minimal blocks, then every pair of those minimal blocks can intersect in at most one point. They are either disjoint or, or only one point because otherwise I would get an even smaller uh, non-trivial uh, block. Okay, so but then let's, let's take omega and let's pick a point, let me call it, uh, say, say, P. So this is my point, and let's look at all the minimal blocks that contain this. Well, then outside this point, they are disjoint, okay? And so there are no more than n minus one of them, okay? So it's completely straightforward, okay? So how is this going to play a role? Well, there will be a case when we, are, when we, we shall want to have a canonical um, select, we want to select a, can a canonical uh, a system of imprimitivity. And that just doesn't work. There is no such thing. Okay, so the Cayley graph example, for instance, if I have an elementary abelian group, so a vector space over a finite field, then all, then all subgroups are equivalent, so, and all subgroups, all, all elements, uh, so all cyclic subgroups are going to generate M m maximal systems of imprimitivity, they are all equivalent, okay? So there is no canonicity there. But what we do then, we individualize one member of that set of at most n minus, n minus one elements. I can, I can, if I have a canonical set of objects, not one object is canonical, but a set of objects is canonical, and the set of objects has k elements, then I can say that now I individualize one of these and this incurs a multiplicative cost of k. So uh, if I look at the other input that generates a similar set of objects, then I will have to then pick separately in parallel every one of those corresponding objects. Yes? No, 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 no. A canonical object. What's a canonical object? A canonical object per se makes no sense. A functor makes sense that associates with every one of my objects, like every graph, associates something. For instance, a partition or, or, or a system of blocks or a, 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 a graph or something. But in such a manner that if I look at two inputs, okay. Okay, so, okay, my functor uh, what does it do? The functor associates with every object an object, so that's going to be the corresponding object. As per, uh, it's a block system of blocks or, or, or another graph or something. And here also, but the functor does more. It, it doesn't just associate objects with objects. It also associates morphisms with morphisms. So if I, uh, my morphisms will always be isomorphisms. So if I take an isomorphism between two of my input objects, then that induces, it is supposed to induce an isomorphism between these objects that I constructed. That's what it means that this construction, so not the object itself, but the construction of the object is canonical, okay? And that's what we that's what we need always. So, so we are we are going to when when I say that we are we 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 find a canonical partition. That means we do that for all objects, and and it is canonical, meaning that isomorphisms of these objects in in, in induce isomorphisms of those partitions. Are, are the of the 
No, the objects are the objects are the, the, the input strings. Okay? Those are my objects. So the group itself is fixed. No, no, the, the ambient group is fixed. And the, my objects are all the strings on that given set omega. Okay? And the morphisms, the G isomorphisms of these strings. Okay? However, canonicity is transitive. So if to these input strings I somehow canonically as, uh, constructed some graphs, and then I forget about my input strings and I look just at, at, at the graphs, and out of the graphs I canonically constructed some partition, then that's also canonically associated with the, with the original inputs that I forgot about. So, so composition of functors is a functor. If I want to individualize something, okay, then that incurs a multiplicative factor, okay? If, 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 I have an, uh, if I have a canonical set of objects and that set has k elements in it. So for instance, I don't have a canonical partition, I have a set of k partitions. Okay. And I want to simply uh, fix my site on one of them, yeah. okay? Then here is x, okay? Now here is y, and there I also have those k partitions. I can't predict which one is going to correspond to this choice. So you need to check I need to repeat, check, check for each of them, yes. Okay, so uh, f uh, there, are there are two. Yes. Okay. So there are there are several divide and divide and conquer techniques at play in this algorithm. There are group theoretic divide and conquer techniques, and then then there, there are combinatorial divide and conquer. Now the, the the basic group theoretic divide and conquer is Lux's algorithm, where the principle how we divide up something simply comes from the structure of the ambient group. So. So what kind of partitions are inherent in the structure of a permutation group? Uh, the first thing is the partition into orbits, okay? And once it is transitive, so that partition doesn't work anymore, uh, then, then there may be blocks of imprimitivity, okay? So okay? The, the first thing we do, or so we want to do divide and conquer, so we need to do divide. Yeah, we need to do divide, yes. So divide, like, the easier divide is just by orbits. Yeah, okay. It reduces the problem to, tran to the case of transitive groups. Okay, it's a reduction. We can think of it as a reduction step. Yes, now we can assume that. And once, the, once I have the orbits, then I, then I uh, divide them up into blocks of imprimitivity. Imprimitivity. No, I'm sorry. So this doesn't occur. This problem doesn't arise in Lux's algorithm, okay? Because we are working with the ambient group. So this uh, this arises in a in a in a different context where where somehow magically I construct a group from out of nothing, and then that group is somehow canonically associated with this, my objects. However, it is not the full automorphism group. It's just a group, and then I try to use the structure of that group. So when a group is canonically associated with my input, that means the, 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 the set of all maximal systems of imprimitivity is also canonical, but one individual system of imprimitivity is not canonical, the associated with my input string x. But here in Lux's algorithm, we don't talk about the input string. The input string plays no role in this partitioning. This is only the ambient group, and there, we, uh, we don't, uh, there, is, there is no canonicity issue there. Okay, so there are two different things. One is the divide Yes. No, I don't need to check. I mean, if it, when, 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 yeah. When when I constructed a group along the way, it is not my ambient group. That's not what she's asking. It's, it's just it happens in the divide and conquer that uh, you need you want to divide according. 
into the blocks of imprivacy, but you don't need partition okay, to so block. No, but, but, but in Lux, this algorithm it doesn't matter. In, in my algorithm, when the group is already coming from somewhere else. So, so basically, the place where this occurs is when I construct these local certificates, and if the local certificates are positive, then I get a permutation group. And that permutation group is canonically associated with my input, but it is not the ambient group. It doesn't have anything to do with my ambient group. Uh, it, it doesn't even act on that set. It acts on a different set. And then, then all sorts of things that are canonically associated with that group are canonically associated with my input. But in that case, the set of blocks is not canonically uh, so, uh, associated. So uh, just the set of systems is, is canonically associated. So OK, I'm sorry this, is now, this was really jumping between two things. I, I just wanted to uh, say something mathematical about, uh, about the notion of blocks of imprimitivity that will be used later. Uh, I'm sorry? K or n to the k when you're... No, if I, if I individualize one object out of k, then the multiplicative cost is k. So, you need to so for instance, if I individualize a vertex out of n possible vertices, then the cost is n. If I individualize a triple of vertices, then the cost is n cubed, because there are n cubed triples of vertices. Okay? You need to match this one against all the options. Right. Exactly. OK, so, so if, 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 if I individualize one of the systems, minimal, maximal systems of imprimitivity, that means I individualized one object out of n minus 1. So the multiplicative cost is n minus 1. OK, all right. So, so I'd like to get back to, to, to just, uh, just running down on uh, Lux's, uh, Lux's algorithm. So, uh, so um, we have a very efficient recurrence that goes block by block. That, that I'm sorry, it goes orbit by orbit and always looks at the input string only within within one orbit. Okay, so here is the input string uh, I don't know x, and here is the input string y, and we ignore the rest and we just want to match up these two. Okay, and so we find the set of isomorphisms. We 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 we, we move one of the strings. Give that as a title. Right. Okay. The proof of that. But that's group theory. Yeah, I understand. That's group theory. Yes, it is. I, okay, I, I, I could do that also. I mean, that would definitely. So, in algebra seminars, I give that proof and takes an hour and a half. So, uh, and that's a seminar usually where people are very well prepared in group theory. So, um, but I can give still. I, I can give some idea. Okay, so 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 let me let me let me give a menu. Okay, uh, so first of all, local certificates. Okay, so that's an algorithm. That's a group theoretic algorithm. Okay, then then uh, uh, the result of this is okay. Uh, so the result is that we get local certificates, and then comes the aggregation. Okay, so how do we create something global out of those local certificates? And one of the possible outcomes is that we get a canonical. K are a relation where K is logarithmic. And then there are two uh, c c purely combinatorial reduction steps. The first one I call the design lemma, which moves from K are to binary. So out of a, a K are relation under some condition, it constructs a regular graph that is canonical. And the next is the split or Johnson. that out of binary, out of a graph, constructs, uh, constructs the Johnson graph. OK? And always, when I say out of KR, it constructs binary, or else it satisfies A or B. So either it constructs a good coloring, or it constructs a good partition, or it constructs a binary uh, embedded structure. And the same thing here. Uh, if, uh, if I now have a graph, 
then it either constructs a, a, a key, a, a, it either constructs a, a good coloring or a, or a, a good partition, or it constructs a Johnson graph. Each of these involve multiplicative cost. Here, the multiplicative cost is n to the theta of k, so essentially n to the k, where k is anything. But in the application, k will be logarithmic. Here, simply, it's explicitly quasi-polynomial, mul the multiplicative cost. So that's the cost. It's quasi-polynomial. And of course, this is also quasi-polynomial if k is uh, the specific thing that I, uh, uh, I'm going to use. Okay. And, and I like to separate this because the method is very different. These two methods are, 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 are very different, and, 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 and the setting is also different. Also, what is happening is uh, how the multiplicative co uh, cost is incurred is different in this stage than here. Here, we explicitly individualize k minus 1 vertices of, of that structure, whereas here it is not. It cannot be interpreted. We, we introduce another ideal set, and, 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 and then ideal objects, and, and, and we individualize uh, those ideal objects, and that's going to add up to, uh, to, to, to this uh, quasi-polynomial cost. Okay? Okay? And then, then it would be a completely separate thing going off on a limb to, to prove the group theory. Okay? So, or give some idea of the group theory. Now, I should say that the aggregation is still, th this is group theory, this is group theory, okay? So I start the group theory. And the, the, the unstart things are combinatorics. They have, they have minimal use of groups in them. The symmetry group is mentioned in, in, the, in the split or Johnson. And that lemma, the, uh, the, that lemma that I said was uh, 1870 from Jordan, that is being used even here. Yes, yes, okay, so you're yeah, right, all right, so uh, um, so let me let me say that what what uh, what could be an output of the local certificates algorithm, one possible output is a canonical k relation, which then will lead down to the Johnson graphs, okay this is all part of taking this uh, desert and building the Johnson graph yes, all of this. yes, yeah, well, not all of this. Uh, yes, you, you could say that it all of it. Yes, you, you could say that all of it is. Yes, yes, yes. So all the action occurs on the set gamma, and and so the local cert. Well, okay. The lo there are two kinds of local certificates. So, so um, what we want to do is always we want to know something about the image of the automorphism group here. Okay. That's always, that's the big unknown thing here. Big or small, I don't know how big. And, and, and I want to, 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 to say that, okay, it is not the full symmetric group here, and I can actually somehow constructively limit what it could be. And so uh, the, the, the completely explicit limitation here would be actually declare a smaller group that contains that image. But there is an intermediate stage where I sort of implicit, I am implicitly explicit. And that is that I give an invariant structure here, like, like, a, 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 like a partition or, or, or like, a, well, that's, that's not, it's like an invariant, no, no, an invariant relation, okay? So I give an invariant relation, then I know that the, that already signifies that the group will be much smaller, and it is already somewhat explicit. Of course, to determine what it actually does with my automorphism group would be equivalent to the isomorphism problem. So, so in a way, I didn't get any reduction. But no, I did, because then I can, I can already, it's explicit enough that I can do, use the combinatorics to get the further reduction. So group theory is out, at that point, group theory is out. Okay, so that is the, uh, so, so that is the, 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 the my, my, my goal now is to find an invariant relation here a canonical relation here. And I would love to find a canonical binary relation, but I can't. Instead, I find a, a, a KRE relation where K is logarithmic. And how do I find that? That's the local certificates. Okay? And, and, and the, the measure of locality is this number K, which is sort of logarithmic. So, um, okay, so I could review what the local certificates are. That's, that's, a, that's a possibility. Uh, I can certainly not do the aggregation without at least saying something about that. Well, let's do the local 
certificates and see whether review the local yeah. certificates. Okay, all right. So here is my set omega, and then here is this gamma. And <coughs> OK, so um, here is the group G. It has its uh, surjection on, say, the symmetric group on gamma. <coughs> and, and, uh, and now I want to see uh, what happens with the automorphism group. That's just my, my schematic drawing for uh, okay, this uh, this doesn't make sense because I'm not lo looking at a subset of omega, but uh, but uh, this is sort of a superstructure that uh, uh, the, where that automorphism group is being mapped. Okay, and and the way I try to figure this out is by looking at it locally. Okay, so if this is the entire symmetric group, which is something I could uh, have already decided, but but let me pretend I didn't. But if this is the entire symmetric group, then it also acts as the symmetric group on a test set. I pick a test set. The test set is just a small subset, logarithmic size subset. And so what I do is I look at uh, G sub T. G sub T is the subgroup of G that fixes this test set setwise. Okay? And this G sub T, of course, maps onto the symmetric group on T. Okay? So what I do is I G sub T max maps onto the symmetric group on T times the symmetric group on the complement, but the complement then I ignore. I restrict it to T. That's a homomorphism. Let me call this Psi sub T. So this is a giant homomorphism. And now what I, what I try to find out, where does Psi sub T map the automorphism group? Okay, so the automorphism group of X with respect to now G sub T only. Okay, so my question is, where does that go? Okay, so, so I look at two possible cases. Okay, either it goes on the symmetric group, so symmetric group on T, or alternating group, so it's a giant on T, or, or, uh, or not. Okay, so in this case I say T is full, and here T is not full. Yes, but that is not helpful enough. N not helpful enough. Pardon? Okay, so T has little T elements. Uh, logarithmic. Okay, so this is uh, actually uh, it is going to be two plus base two log of uh, the size of, of n uh, rounded up. OK? That's, that's my t. What's g? N or n? I'm sorry? Oh, g sub t. g sub t is the setwise stabilizer of t in g. So g sub t is the setwise stabilizer of the set t. Maybe not. Exactly. I mean, the identity is usually there, but <laughs> not nothing else. No. Yeah. Omega. Omega. Yeah. No. Okay. So the only thing that we know about this is that, that it is, it is uh, less than polylog of n and less than n. So gamma is in a wide range uh, of, uh, of possibilities. I'm sorry? Yeah. And, and, and uh, yeah, if, 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 uh, if gamma is essentially n, say constant times n, or, 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 or much greater than square root of n, then the case becomes easy. But square root of n is, it becomes a, a hard case. So that's, that's, that's where everything stopped uh, 
uh, for a long time. Okay, so so it is it is actually instructive to think of n as about square root of n. Okay. So now, <coughs> what I what I want, okay, ultimately what I want is um, is a k r relation, okay. So R subset of gamma to the k. That's that's we want that. This and it should be canonical. Oh, I'm sorry, t. Yeah, it is t. Thank you. Yes, k is t. So that's what we want. We want a theory relation that is canonical and, and that is uh, non-trivial in the way that it cannot be, it doesn't have a symmetric group of automorphisms. In fact, it doesn't even have a 90% symmetric group of automorphisms. Okay? So it has with at least, say, 10% symmetry defect. Okay, so that means uh, I can't have a ninety percent uh, of the uh, of the s of gamma on which uh, every permutation is allowed. Okay, so that's uh, that's one possible goal. Okay, other goals are just get, get a good good coloring or get a good partition. But why is uh, okay? So how are we going to achieve this? Uh, <coughs> Well, it comes from the negative certificates, okay? So if, if uh, we don't have full action, that means that if I order this set, so this, uh, these are ordered t-tuples, okay? Then I get an ordered t-tuple. And this ordered t-tuple I already know cannot move to any other ordered t-tuple, namely just on this set already. Now, this is not enough. I have to look at all the other possible test sets, and I also have to find out where this thing goes, okay? So, okay, if this is full, this is not full, then there is no such thing. If both of them are full, then, then I don't deal with this case. If both of them are not full, then the exact same algorithm that produces for me a proper subgroup of this symmetric group here actually also produces a, a proper coset of bijections between these two. And in fact, I do that. I double it up. I do this not just for, for, for x, my input x, OK? But I have the same set gamma for, for the input y. It's the same set. These two sets are the same. However, being in the image of the automorphism group is, is not the same. And then what I do is I look at a test set here with respect to x and an, another test set with respect to y. So I look at all such pairs, and I will still be able to determine which k-tuples go to which k-tuples and which don't. Now that defines now a canonical relation. Okay, So, so then I look at just, just uh, with respect to x, I look at this ordered k-tuple and all its uh, possible uh, images. And that's a relation, and this is now canonical because, because I already s harmonized it across the two, uh, two inputs. Okay? So when I so talk about categories here, I'm talking about a very small category. It has only, had the only two objects, one corresponding to x and one corresponding to y. Uh, uh, and then I look at these uh, small objects. There is a poly uh, quasi polynomial number of them, so it will be a category which has this quasi polynomial number of little objects. OK, so it's still a very small category. I can, I can just uh, do complete search. This p, this value, this exact value of p is, 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 is from the uh, uh, un, uh, unaffected, uh, unaffected stabilizers uh, uh, lemma. So this is the threshold that, uh, oh, I have to be strictly greater than this, so it is, uh, okay. Doesn't matter, okay, I add one more, plus one, okay? And, and then I am strictly greater, I have to be strictly greater. So 
but this is 2 plus log yeah. 2. <laughs> the reason is uh, related but different. Uh, so this result does not use camera. The, the, the unaffected stabilizer lemma does not use camera. Um, it, but, it, but, but both of them use uh, um, the onan scott lemma, which is, which is the structure theorem about primitive groups. Not so surprisingly. I mean, we are talking about both, of, both, both results talk about primitive. No, no, the, the unaffected stabilizer lemma does not talk about primitive groups. However, the proof starts with, OK, so that's the hierarchy of groups. I mean, we, we prove, want to prove something about permutation groups, then we pro first prove something about primitive groups, and then we extend it to transitive, and then we put it together to all groups. So that's, that's, uh, <coughs> that's the structure. And, 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 and uh, really, the tightness of this comes out of the case of primitive groups. So, um, so yes. So the case of not fullness, if that sort of dominant, it, if there is a large part that is now another kind of desert where nothing is full, then we get this relation. Okay? So that's one uh, branch of the aggregation process. If this is dominant, then we aggregate these non-fullness certificates into a canonical, a canonical theory relation. The other possibility is when, when fullness is dominant, and I can define the dominance here, what it means, in which case we are looking at the fullness certificates that I haven't now defined. Uh, well, I haven't defined the non-fullness either. But those are, uh, are actual, actual permutation groups that are subgroups of the automorphism group. So we, all, we put them together. Now we have a rather rich set of automor uh, rich group of automorphisms. And that's a permutation group which has a structure, and we use the structure to split things. So even when there are many automorphisms that we find, we don't use that to produce a large automorphism group. We use it to, to cut up gamma. Cut up gamma with the help of the group theoretic structure of that group that we get. Yes, OK? All right. OK, so let me define what these certificates are. Um, OK, so the fullness certificate is, <coughs> let, uh, I call it k of t. It's a subgroup of the automorphism group of my string x with respect to this um, group G, actually the stabilized set by stabilizer of the test set of that, such that this uh, C of t maps k, uh, k of t onto a symmetric or alternating, so giant on t. Okay? So this is a very constructive verification of fullness. I actually produce actual automorphisms uh, so that the group that I produce is rich enough that that already maps onto uh, the uh, giant on, on T. Okay? That's the fullness certificate. And, <coughs> and this is the type of problem with which I struggled for, for, for an infinite amount of time. The, uh, how do I get automorphisms of the entire string, not some partial string, out of local information. So how do I get global automorphisms out of local information? So that's what the uh, unaffected stabilizer's lemma accomplishes for us. And then the other thing, the non-fullness certificate, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's very simple. Uh, the non-fullness certificate is a subgroup M of t uh, of just the symmetric group on t. So that's a local. So this is a global object. And this is a local object. And it is strictly, it's not a giant. OK? OK, so it's so strictly that it's not even the alternating group. It's, it's just not a giant. That's the non-fullness. And it comes with the guarantee that the image of, <coughs> where did I? Uh, image of the automorphism group, but, but, but it is, it must be on the blackboard somewhere. So anyway, the image of the su such that uh, C of T of the automorphism group of, of X 
with respect to this g sub t is contained in m of t. So it comes with this guarantee, OK? This guarantee arises from the following thing, that already the automorphism group of a partial string is going to be contained in this. And then, of course, if I, uh, so that means I ignored uh, a large part of the input. But then if I add the rest of the input, the group just gets smaller. So it will, it will be even more a subgroup of this, OK? So, so this MT itself is going to be not uh, contain, uh, cont uh, containing this, but, but equal to an automorphism group of a partial string, OK? And when I say a partial string, partial string means it defined on a subset, but it has to be defined on a canonical subset. And it is, uh, it is defined on a canonical subset. OK? All right. So this is, these are the two types of certificates that I, that I, that I am looking for. And, 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 and the, way I, uh, the, the way I try to find this is using this dichotomy of affected or not affected. And, 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 and the punchline is that, that, that when I already got a, a subgroup, that, that uh, refuses to get smaller, then I reduce it by, by, by fixing every point that has not been affected. And that turns the local to, into global, because fixed points cannot destroy any letters. So fixed points, um, if, I, if I have a permutation and I know that, it, uh, that the parts that it actually moves are, uh, are uh, preserving the letters in the string, those parts that don't move anything cannot destroy that. So that, that's, the, uh, that's sort of the punchline in, in, constructing, in constructing this. OK? So yes. Um, OK, let me say a few words about the aggregation. OK? Uh, so I already said what happens with the aggregation of fullness certificates. I didn't say what it means to be dominant. And, and that I can define from the other side. So. Uh, <coughs> So aggregation. So I first, what I do is I first look at the fullness certificates. So fullness certificates are this. Um, these are subgroups. Uh, and I look at the subgroup they generate. That's a subgroup of the automorphism group of x, OK? Because each of these groups is a subgroup of the automorphism group. So now I got a, a, a rich group of automorphisms. And this group, let me call it f. And then let me call, uh, so that has an image, a phi image, that, that I, I denote by f super gamma. So that's the f action on gamma. Okay, so on the set gamma, this group acts somehow. And now, if, okay, so if the support of this f to the gamma, so this f action on gamma, is large, say, say greater than 10% uh, of m, m, m is the size of gamma. Okay. Then, okay. Then I can assume that it is at least ninety percent. Because if it is in between, then I have a good partition. Okay. So this group is canonically associated with my uh, with my input. And so suppose this is the support. Support is the elements that, uh, that are actually moved, so that are not common fixed points of the entire group. Okay? So if this is the support of, uh, of uh, f to the gamma, then this partition is a canonical, uh, color, as a canonical coloring. Okay? First color is the support. Second color is the rest. Okay? So if it is between 10% and 90%, I am happy. If it is less than 10%, if it is less than 10%, that means that the desert is dominant. OK, the little part that goes by, by easy recurrence, the big part is the other case. So that's when I say that, that the non-fullness uh, is dominant. 
So now I, look, I have to look at only the case when fullness is dominant, meaning that more than 90% is the support. And then I can ignore the 10% part, and I can imagine that, that the support of, uh, so, so, uh, so it, 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 I, can, I can simply assume uh, uh, that, that the support is an, the entire gamma. That's, pardon? No, 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 no. F is, a, F is an aggregate, okay? So this is F to the gamma. That means the gamma F action on gamma, so here, and that already moves everything. So all points are, so there is no, this partition doesn't exist. I am already moving everything, okay? So, so F to the gamma, okay, now, uh, what can happen with this is I could have orbits, okay? So this is a permutation group. This is a permutation group on gamma. I can have orbits, and uh, but but this uh, but these orbits are at least two elements. There is no fixed point, okay? And in this case, what I got is I got a partition. When is this partition not satisfactory already for my purposes? Okay. The only case when this is not satisfactory if one of the one of the blocks of this partition, so one of the orbits is 90%. If every orbit is less than 90%, this is not a coloring, but it is a partition, okay? The, 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 if I have two orbits of equal size, then they could be switched by under an isomorphism between my two input strings, but that doesn't bother me. Okay? So what I basically technically what I do is if I have such a partition, then first of all, I infer a coloring from that. The color of any point will be the size of, of the block of the partition containing it. Okay? If this is a good coloring, then I am already fine. If this is not a good coloring, then there is a dominant color, but that dominant color is equipartition. The only problematic case is if this equipartition is trivial. Okay? So, 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 so that means that there is a single orbit. That is 90%. Okay, but then the 10% I can ignore again, and and uh, I can assume that this is transitive. So now that's the next case. So f to the gamma. Yes, but if an orbit is 90%, then there is only one. That's unique. That's canonical. Okay, there cannot be two orbits of 90% size, right? So that's that's a good that's uh, that's uh, uh, that, that, that I don't have this problem of canonicity. That's automatically canonical. Um, okay. So now I can assume that this is transitive. If it is transitive, then it is um, I don't know s transitive for some s. Okay. So I max. So that that's the, uh, that means that it is transitive on the ordered s tuples of distinct elements. So s transitive means transitive on the m times n minus 1 times etc. m minus s plus 1 ordered s tuples. That's a definition. So I am now in the case where s is at least 1. Okay? And now there is a theorem from Wieland 1934 which says that if this is not a, oh, and, uh, okay, and I also know that this is not a giant. Because if it was a giant, then that case has already been discussed, okay? So, but if it is, if it is S transitive and it is not a giant, then Wieland tells us that this is less than hard, three times natural log of M. I'm sorry? Didn't you improve this? I didn't improve this, no. Uh, there is a weaker result that is probably already in Jordan, but I would need to double check that, which says that this is at most log squared then, essentially. And for that, we have a very element, uh, a, a, a one page proof uh, from also from 30 years ago with Akos Sheresh. Uh, but it doesn't matter. Uh, now, the truth is so, truth. Okay, truth has actually been revealed. S is at most. Okay, so there are no six tuply transitive permutation groups, and in fact, if 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 if, if m if m is at least twenty five, 
then s is at most 3. And of course, I can assume that m is at least 25 because I don't care for small cases. I'm sorry? Classification? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is absolutely, this is based on the classification of finite simple groups. However, however, Wieland has another result which says that s is at most, I don't know, 7, assuming Schreier's hypothesis. So now Schreier's hypothesis is a consequence of classification, but that I call a modest application of the classification of finite simple group. So under Schreier, so that's also Wieland under Schreier's hypothesis. Schreier's hypothesis says that the outer automorphism group of a finite simple group is solvable. Okay, so it's a very simple statement, and the only way we know to verify it is by looking at the list of, 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 of finite simple groups. But, uh, but nevertheless, this is a very simple consequence. So, for instance, uh, I don't know. Um, okay, all right. So what I do here is this: if it is S transitive, then I individualize. S minus one points. Now then it becomes then S becomes one, and I only individualized uh, even even without the classification on a logarithmic number of points, but actually only a constant number of points. In fact, it is worth trying it this way because if we get something that is still uh, uh, a higher degree of transitivity, then that will construct an explicit counterexample to the classification. So that's that's actually that's a good payoff, uh, right? Uh, right. Okay. So, so, so it is not that the algorithm will fail in some hidden way. It will fail in a very explicit way that, that gives a spectacular other output. OK? So, so now it's one transitive. One transitive, and it is not two transitive. But that means that, means that OK, now here is. Uh, so this is now transitive and not doubly transitive. That means that if I look at the orbit of a pair, then that's a directed graph that is not complete. I found an invariant graph. OK? That was one of my goals, finding an invariant graph. I mean, I, uh, I wanted to find an invariant k relation. k equal 2 is wonderful. I, I can skip the next uh, phase. Okay, so I found an invariant graph which is biregular, regular in and regular out. I need to verify, and that let me leave that as a homework exercise. If I have a non-trivial regular graph or biregular digraph, then its uh, symmetry defect is at least one half. On a regular graph, I cannot have a symmetry group act on more than half of the vertices. In a, on a non-trivial uh, uh, regular graph, okay. And that's it. Okay? So that's that's the aggregation. Okay? okay. So maybe it's a good time to stop. To, to have lunch, right? <laughs>